Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? We want to also welcome our guests, welcome our state nationals. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to church. Amen. Because we are the church. Glory to God. When we come together, we come together as one. Amen. And God said that we are going to have to stand, and we are going to have to stand as one more now than ever before. You know, hmm. Today, this weekend, we celebrate Memorial Day. Memorial Day weekend. We know what that means, right? For those that gave their lives for this country, for us. But we also want to make sure we recognize and celebrate the one that came and gave for all. Amen. Amen. And he gave those rights for all, gave us back what was lost in the beginning that I didn't do. But I fell in the line. Right? But Jesus came back and said, I'm going to take it on so that I can walk in. But then we have those that also, because our country is founded on the word of God. We know that, right? So then we have those that came and they fought for our freedoms. But guess what? Now it's put in our hand. Are we going to maintain those freedoms? Are we going to go back and fight for those freedoms that were given up? And we have to learn that as we go. Do we expect to get it right away? No. Just like when we get born again, what do we got to do? We got to first find him and then start the process. So we're going to go to Ephesians 3. But God has been really, you know, I love where he's got us going because, you know, Pastor Danny's been talking about it. I've been talking about it. We talk about the purpose. What if some of us were only created for one purpose? <coughs> But yet the one purpose is maybe a one big purpose, but look at all the opportunities in there for other purposes. But God has also shared some people want to sit here and they want to try to hold on and make every opportunity that big purpose. But God had laid on me about turning the tides. Y'all, have y'all heard that? The term turning the tides. Some things I'm like, yeah, I've heard it. I don't have a clue. And it's where you come in and you turn your situation around. No one else can do it but you, correct? But you have to accept what's been laid out for you. We have so many people, we talk about this and talk about this. We have so many people murmuring and complaining right now about life and what's the, you know, I can't do this and I can't do that. Says who? Says you because you've accepted what someone else said that doesn't line up with what the word said. No, see, you have to now, we had those that have lost their lives that gave us the freedoms that we have, but if we don't want to keep the freedoms, then no one's at fault but what? Us in our own lives, right? So just bear with me as we go because it's funny, it's talking to a couple people the other day and they're like, are you going to go back to Esther? Well, I might. I just want to do that. Because there's so much in Esther. There's so much in Daniel. There's so much... In everyone's lives, in this, the little May, I mean, there's so much there. But so many times what we forget is whenever there's one that is obedient to God, it's to what? For someone else to be able to walk. And this is where people got to get this. When one's obedient to the instruction of God, actually what it's doing, it's setting the opportunity and a door to be open for someone else to walk through it so that they can sit here and obey in the purpose and the obedience of God. It's not just for one person to get the glory. That's not what it's about. It's about for everybody to line up and everybody to do their part to open the door up for what? Those that are coming. Right? But it's up to what? Us to do that. Just like with Esther. It's funny because I woke up and I, I was preparing for this morning and one night with King was on. I was like, well, there we go. And again, you go back and you, have, you look at Esther. Esther was doing it for a nation, but it also set up something so significant for Mordecai. He was the one that had the ring. He was the one that got to go in and decree and declare. He couldn't change the law, but what he could do is make a way when there was no way. He made an opportunity out of something that like, was well, already put in place. Right? What the king had put in place. Well, what did our king put in place? Freedom. Freedom.
freedom to be who he created us to be, but we have placed ourselves in so much bondage. And we do it by what? Murmuring and complaining, accepting the things that are not of God in our lives. You know, I was sitting there and something occurred this weekend and I really struggled with it because I thought, why didn't I know that? Why did I not? And you know how we talk about common sense? Sometimes common sense ain't so common. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And there was things that I, God began to reveal. I'm like, we're going to, we'll talk about some of this stuff, but God began to reveal, and I was like, you so protected me years ago. When I was put in situations that I truly had no clue what was going on. I didn't know how to respond correctly. I thought they were a certain way based on my limited understanding. And so God so much could have happened to me, but it didn't because you had my back. Now, what do you mean? Well, he had my back, not just through the Holy Spirit leading and guiding, but also others that would hear the Holy Ghost and go, oh, no, that's not what they're doing. No, no, they're setting you up. Really? We talked about this, some of the things that I learned years ago that I was like, okay, why are they doing this? I mean, I don't understand. Well, again, it's to what? It was to start grooming. It's a grooming process. So there's things in my life I mean, and I've always, I got to that place, Lord, I just felt, there is no telling what he may thought when they looked at me going, she is really dumb. She is really, really, truly dumb. And that wasn't it. God knew I didn't know. No, and he knew that there was those around me that they might have known, but they weren't telling me. So who's going to protect me? The one that I trust in, right? But now I know. There's things he's showing me that now I know. And I'm like, man, whoo. They had a good laugh on me back then, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. But now I know, and I'm like, wow. It helped me understand why people treated me the way they do, why they spoke to me the way they do, did. Now, I'm not talking about true Christians either. I'm talking about when the world saw an opportunity. God did bless that opportunity for me to, to do me to do me wrong based on selfish motives. And he's not gonna let that happen to you either. If you're truly his. He'll either bring you the revelation of that or he'll bring someone in your life that has the revelation of that. But here's what we gotta get past if it comes against what we have. Because right now we're at a place that we gotta be careful what we think. We gotta be careful what we see. We gotta be careful what we hear. We just do. So we're going to go to Ephesians 3.1. It's for this cause I call the prisoner. Now, isn't that interesting? He said the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace, which is administration, stewardship, of the grace of God, which is given me to you or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. Now that word mystery, we talked about it, talked about it, but it means it's actually something that's kept in secret that can only be revealed one way, and it's not by knowledge. It's got to be revealed by revelation. That's why revelation is so important. We get in the Bible. And what, is, what do we call the Bible? It's a book of what? It's a book of knowledge, right? It's a book of knowledge. It's a book of Jesus, correct? But to get revelation, how do you do that? Got to get it by the Holy Spirit. So he's sitting here and he's talking about the mystery, and that's where a lot of people go, oh, God's so mysterious. No, not to the ones that have the Spirit of God. Living on the inside of them. When he says mystery, he's literally saying, that there are things hidden in that book that you can't see or know until you allow the Holy Spirit to bring you revelation of it. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Just like we can have a whole room full of people. We can have all these gifts, all these talents in here. And God has designed those ones that have gotten into a place that hear the Holy Spirit. That are obedient to the Holy Spirit. That whenever it's time to unwrap someone's gift 
or time to let them know, do you know your gift? However God wants to do this, what are one of the first things that happen? I can't go say this is your gift without also saying what you need to do to grow in the gift. But see, some people go, I've got the gift, but they don't want to do what it takes to be able to grow in that. That means every day we have to be willing to also be excited about what we're to grow in, but be open to what we get corrected in. Because I can't grow in the things that are holy if I don't allow God to deal with the things in me that are not. Attitudes. Thinking. Remember, he says, be ye not conformed to this world. Don't become like the world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you've got to get in that first. Start thinking differently before the Holy Spirit can do what he needs to do. Right? Everybody good? Okay. So he says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. See? The mysteries, this book is amazing. People, if you want to go watch TV or you want to read all these novels, I like these novels and these novels, get the word. I promise you every one of them in there. And yes, some of them are horror stories because it's for the horrors for the ones that don't want to believe and want to continue doing what they're doing. Then there is an outcome for them that is, yeah. But for us, oh, it's nothing but victory. But to be victorious, don't you have to go through a place of grooming and molding? Of course. How did these people go and how did they sit here and, and fight for our freedoms if they didn't know what they were fighting for? We watched a movie last night called The Father's Fight. I've never seen it. I don't, I don't think you'd ever seen it. And it was about a boxer. He had been a previous boxer. And he just got, life just, we, we kind of know the scenarios. Life got tough. Life got hard. Well, so he turned out hard. So in the moment, and he had to kind of explain this because he's been, he he's, was a boxer. So in the moment, and I've talked about it before, He's sitting there, and he's running to the alcohol, but then the time came, he basically lost his family. Like, I'm done. I'm done. So then, of course, his uh, trainer reached out to him and said, hey, one of your old competitors, I'm going to fight you again. And this guy was so out of shape. He wasn't know where he needed to be. But that didn't mean he couldn't be brought back. But he had to be willing to do that. So did he go through stumbling blocks in the process? Absolutely. Absolutely. But one of the things that stood out to me, this guy, this trainer was telling me, he said, you've got to find out what are you fighting for? Because if you don't know what you're fighting for, then you're not going to be, you're not going to win. Or you're not going to go past where you are. What are you fighting for? So I have to ask people, and we, we talk about this. There's so many people that don't have a fight in them. Well, what do you mean? You are wanting to fight to justify the reason that you do what you do and they can't even tell me why. I know, I've been there and there's some things in my life right now, I'm like, why do, why do I feel like I have to fight right there? Why do I? Is it for his glory? Is it for me? I want to be fine. I want to justify why I do what I do. Come on, we got to be honest. So anyway, so he's going and he's and, and he keeps telling him, you've got to find out what are you fighting for. So then he proceeds, he goes on, he's in the boxing match. Now we're down to the boxing match. His thoughts, and Aaron has told me this. Well, he was doing okay, but then he's like, well, where's my wife? Because things were starting to go good. So he had invited her. And he was looking for her. Well, when you're in a fight, you can't look to the left. You can't look to the right. And he had to teach me this. And I, because here's me, <laughs> the one that is like, oh, yeah, I like to just, hey, be up, you know, in his business and like, oh, come on, honey, you know, I'm one of those. I'm a toucher and I'm a hugger and all that. But when he's focused, he doesn't do it. He's like totally opposite. And I'm like, fine, you know. I'm your wife. Why are you, I mean, seriously. And I didn't understand. So anyway, so this guy's there, and all of a sudden, he looks out. He's fighting. 
but he looked out for her and took a punch. Hit the mat. He got back up, but I believe I believe the trainer was like, what are you fighting for? Basically, what's your focus? What are you doing? So then he looks back over there after he gets up, and there she is. Now, was that his, I don't know, but all I know is he turned and he went after the guy. And he gave it everything he had. He didn't win the fight, though. He didn't win the fight because it was based on fits. They fought so good. And the guy, it was a David and Goliath thing because the, the guy that came in to fight him was all buff. He had, you know, he was buff. This guy, he was like, ah, you know, making fun of it, even himself. But the thing was, what if that point would have been when he looked away? What if that point that he could have gotten would have been when he turned to look for her? And that one punch was enough that brought the guy over the edge. See, this is what so many people are struggling with right now, is they are sitting here and they have taken their eyes off what they're fighting for. And they're fighting for things that won't get them into heaven. They're fighting for things that have nothing to do with God and his purpose. They're fighting for their opinions and they're fighting for their, their what they call right. Those aren't rights. Those are enslavements. I've never seen people fight so hard for bondage. I've never seen people fight so hard for bondage. And God has had to show me as well the areas for my life that I'm like, oh, no, God, I'm standing. And God's like, to that you're standing? See, we all have to go through a place of growth. And we never stop growing. If somebody says they have, they're wrong. Because now they're in bondage. What are they in bondage to? That place. That they're never willing to grow past. Come on. So then he goes on. Hmm. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Isn't that interesting? He says, for whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by what? The Spirit. So he's making it very clear. Now you can sit here and you can read that you may understand my knowledge. But what did, how did they understand the knowledge? Because Paul had to what? Sit down and talk to him about it, right? Didn't Paul have to sit and teach? Well, right now, aren't we hearing about all this false doctrine, these false prophets? And I'm telling you, this false doctrine is coming up heavy, and it's coming up fast. And that's why it's so important that we stay in the Word of God. I mean, it's getting more. It's not like it's not been there. It's just now what? Being revealed. There are now people, look, False teachers, false prophets, they're saying, they're coming from the church, they're coming from God. They're saying all these things, and now there is uh, some coming out that are now talking just because they know how to pique interest by, the enemy knows how to pique your interest by hearing your conversations. So now one of the big things that's starting to come out, the earth is not land. The earth is actually flat, and they're taking Genesis, and they're twisting Genesis. And they're using God's word saying that the earth is flat. That's not what that means. And he's talking about the firmament and this and this. You live in a bubble. And what you see up in the sky is floating stars. There's nothing else up there. It's just that. I don't think that's what God said. But this is being taught to children. Yeah. They're not even bringing evolution up anymore. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. He says false prophets, false teachers, false doctrine. But what is it doing? It's trying to go through the word to get your attention, but it's not true. So what are we supposed to do here if we're a Bible training center? Speak truth. But how many people does it make mad? Why? Because it challenges you to grow? Because it challenges you to get out of the bondage of the position you're in in the moment? 
Because if you don't, you can't get upset because you chose not to walk in the freedom that not just Jesus gave us, but men and women that have died to keep for us. But then we have those out there fighting and they believe they're fighting for something of freedom but it's really bondages that have been created that sound like freedom. Now it's tough to hear, I know. But if we're not honest with ourselves, then we can't grow. We really can't. It's hard. It's hard to hear sometimes. I've cried a lot lately from the things that God's been showing me. And God's been pretty firm with me about. Because we have to get to a point it's like God said, well, if you, if you say that you like something, whatever it may be, it could be video game, it could be whatever, when you say you like it, do you like part of it or do you like all of it? If you say you love something, do you love part of it or do you love all of it? Because whatever you begin to say that it, it becomes a part of you. When it piques your interest, correct? And when it piques your interest, what happens? All of a sudden, you start getting it in you, and it becomes part of you. And then, when it starts becoming part of you, then you get caught up, and you can be turned astray real fast. So that's like even when it comes to teachings, I just don't listen to a lot of people anymore that I did before. Because now I'm hearing some things that, because of where God's had us growing and going, now I see what they don't know doesn't mean they don't love the Lord. But again, they want to talk about revelation of the mysteries. But if there's not a revelation there, then that says something. Are we really seeking it out? Right? Have you ever sat and meditated on something so much that God begins to really just to speak to you through that? That's why I'll take one verse and I'll just sit and talk to God about it. And it's like there's something there I'm not seeing and I'm not going to let it go until I do. So it's like Paul's sitting here and Paul's going, whereby verse 4, when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. But Paul had to sit and explain it. That's why it's so important that we talk the word with one another. Not just always talk about how we feel about something. Because I know for us, I may say, okay, for lack of better words, this is how I feel. But I can't go on my feeling. I need to know more about why is this standing out to me? Because my flesh is always going to what? Well, it's going to come against the spirit. Especially if it makes my flesh feel good. And I know that's not what the, the word is saying. So I need to find out what's in that. Because in that's going to be my breakthrough. In that's going to give me what I need to put this under subjection. But if I'm not willing to take the time, I can't just learn it. I've got to have revelation of it. Because a word should never be a mystery to me. It should never be a mystery to me. So back to when I was talking about the boxing. We had a situation after we had gotten married, and I was trying to talk to him. And, and, and he wasn't being, it's not that he was really being rude, but I didn't understand. I'm talking to him, and he's ignoring me. And he had his, he was like this. So I've learned body language. Body language is everything. So he's like this. And I'm over here just being a little pest. Hey, hey, hey. And he never budged. And he said it was from his boxing ring. And he says, because if you don't focus, you will lose your power if you don't stay focused. We wonder why. So many times it feels like, Lord, I feel like I'm losing. I feel like maybe you're not losing, but if you don't quit focusing on the losing part, you will not win. If you don't focus on what you need to do to get to the place of the victory that was already guaranteed to you, you will never get there. And you'll be like, God, why didn't you? And God said, it wasn't me. Go back to your focus. What were you focusing on? Paul always made it where he's like, look, when you read that, you may understand 
my knowledge, he knew where they were. We do know where people are. People know where I'm at. But what's funny is when the world tries to tell me where I'm at. What's funny is when the world tries to tell me what the word said. Well, I mean, if you're a Christian, then ah, you don't get to. You don't get, you don't have permission to. Now, if somebody I know that is a believer, and they've got something to share with me, okay, what you got? And then I'm open to hear. But the world has no place, no position to tell me who I am in Christ. None. It doesn't you either. But you got to stop accepting. Well, what do you mean? He says we're persecuted for his name's sake. So if you're being persecuted for his name's sake, hey, you're doing something right. But they still have no place unless you give it to them. None. And what was Paul wanting to do? He was trying to get them to understand the mysteries, but he knew what it took. So he said, well, I'll just give you my story, and let me show you what I got. But it was through the revelation that I got these mysteries. But it takes time to get revelation. Meaning, i got to sit down, and i got to, all right, conversation time. Just like the other day, I've been asking the Lord about some things, not for a day, not even for a week, for the last few months. I hadn't had my answer totally. I got bits and pieces. But it wasn't until I, I kept, I wasn't letting it go. But it had to get to a place where I got quiet. And still kept him right there. Doing my everyday duties. As I say duties, you know how we call it. Duties off of the floor, sleeping in on top. But I never take my eyes off of him. I don't care what I'm doing. Because I got to always be ready to hear. And that's why people say, have you ever been in the shower room? in the bathroom and all of a sudden you hear God's voice? Yeah, because you're quiet enough. So why can't I do that when I'm mopping? Why can't I do that when I'm doing laundry? Why can't we do that if you're putting in a floor or if you're, you know, uh, pulling steel or whatever it may be you do? You should always keep him at what? The forefront. Always. So I'm over there mopping. He begins to talk to me and I had to sit there and I stopped for a second. It kind of shook me. And then I was like, and then I forgot what I was doing. And it was okay. It was still there when I got done with my conversation. Hmm. Verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Well, you know that probably didn't make everybody real thrilled, but who? The Gentiles, the unbelievers. Where, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And when we look at that effectual working of his power, we're talking about strong operation. That's And the power he's talking about is the dunamis power, the miracle working power. But it was what? It was strong in the working. How did that happen? Because he spent time. With the Lord. He spent time. If you don't spend, some people go, well, why don't I have that kind of power? You do have that kind of power. You just haven't been with Him enough. You haven't sat there and really found out what does that mean? Does it take all this stuff, this dramatic stuff? No. It takes believing. But if I don't have revelation of something, can I really operate in it? No, because I don't know it. I don't know it. That's why whenever we started talking about, you know, being able to raise the dead, every time you get somebody born again, you have raised somebody from the dead. But how many people have been taught that? No, they've been taught you got somebody got died, and then you got to go over and lay hands on them. Every one of us, if we've led somebody to Christ, guess what? You raised somebody from the dead. They were dead in their sins. Yes. But now they're alive. 
And now, what's one of the biggest scriptures that we've all in this room held fast to? One major one. And there's a lot, but one big one, because we all are quoting it now. Romans what? 8-11. 8, 8 11. Why? Because revelation was brought through the knowledge, and it had to be shared. Correct? But then, now that it's shared, now it's up to you to go what? Get the revelation of that. And how do you do that? It don't come from me. It don't come from you. It comes from him. And once that becomes your revelation, then you are a force to be reckoned with. Because you have the power, oh my goodness, resurrection, life-giving power that you now are beginning to understand and get. <clears throat> now, something to think about. You say you got it. Are you operating? See, once I get revelation of something, it's so big in me, it's like, oh, okay. Now, some things may not happen right away, but God says, okay, we're working on something. We're, okay, look, look what I'm doing, watch, watch. Some things are immediate, some things are gradual, correct? But if you don't get it in you, you don't keep focusing, you don't keep moving forward. I know this may sound simple, but this is where God is at because, you know, Pastor Danny talked about this. Keep it simple. Sometimes, yeah, people don't want to keep it simple. They want to make it harder than it is for an excuse. I did. Oh, no, I can't do that. And then what? Then the world comes along and says, you can't do that. Why? I mean, I've gone to church for, you know, all my life. Really? And so how many people have you brought to Christ? Oh, well, none. I mean, you know, I just go to church. But they're going to tell me I live my life. They don't get to. They don't. Because also, aren't we, again, to look at the fruit? Absolutely. It's not that God doesn't want to use them. Of course he does. But they have to be willing to what? Do the same thing. They really do. Then he goes on and... Verse 8 says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus. Now, this word unsearchable means that literally it can't be traced. It can't be found out. But who's he talking about? The very ones that can't seek it out. The Gentiles, the unsaved, right? The very ones. So when we have to understand, when we are sitting here and dealing with those out there in the world, we have to understand that those things to them, they're unsearchable riches, value, that is going to change their life and save their life. They've got to have what? Someone preaching. Right? But, and people are, look, we know we've got to hear the word and we've got, yes, you do. But again, what do you do after that? He says, I'm up here. And he says, to make all men, verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So Paul's responsibility is, first off, I want you to read. I'm going to explain it. But I can't give you the revelation of it for yourself, but I can give you my revelation of it. Correct? I can give you the truth behind it. So verse 8, again, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace, unmerited favor, given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the ones that are seeking and searching. But right now, it's the unsearchable riches of Christ because they what? They got to find out who he is to want to know him. But they don't know how if it's not preached to them. They don't know how if it's not shared. Well, what has that got to do with us? Okay, I take some of the simplest things, and some people are challenged with it. It's got to be okay, because I had to do it too. Romans 8, 11. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, right? The Bible sits there and tells us by stripes. In Isaiah, we are healed. Then over here in 2 Peter, we were healed. Okay, great. Woohoo, I'm healed. It's still not enough if I don't keep searching more for it. 
So that means, does it mean I'm a Gentile if I don't know something? No, that's just who he's talking about here. But if I haven't found it yet, I haven't sit here and I haven't traced it out yet, the riches, the value, the things for me in him, then what do I got to do? Sit down and have it preached to me. Well, it, I don't like it. I don't like how it's said. I don't like how it sounds. Well, guess what? A lot of them didn't eat. We have conversations about the word all the time that we don't always like, but it's like, well, great. <laughs> Wonderful. I was reading something this morning that I was like, wait a minute. And the Lord spoke to me very strongly. He said, I know how you've heard it in the past, but you can't look at it that way now. Because if, it, if, because if you do, it will challenge everything you've learned up to now. Because it was taught wrong. It was taught weak in weakness. It was taught in water. It wasn't taught in power. It wasn't taught in faith. And I looked, and I said, wait, what? Never mind. You said it. Because we, again, God told me the other day, we're in a new season. Everything is changing. But we've shifted into a new season, his season. What does that look like? Well, I'm not totally sure yet, but just hold on, because in him, everything's good. Right? But are we going to have the struggles in it? Of course. But do you accept the challenge of it? Of course. That means your flesh is about to have to really be put under subjection. You know it. You know it. So then he goes on in verse 9, after we talk about the unsearchable riches of Christ. He says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. He didn't sit here and he didn't say what the knowledge of it is. Right? He said, now comes the what? Fellowship. How do you fellowship? You sit down and you talk, you communicate. You sit and have relationship. And what is he talking about here? He says that to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. I got to, I got to have them see what this fellowship is because in this fellowship comes the relationship. In this fellowship comes the revelation because there's relationship. And then he goes on and he says, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, that right there should answer everybody when it comes to creation. Bam. One verse right there. So, and I know I keep talking about it, but how do you get something? You have to keep what? Hearing it over and over and over. So verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by who? The church. The manifold wisdom of God. So here's the thing. Go back to the garden. Before Adam and Eve did what they did, everything was revealed to them. They knew everything, did they not? Absolutely. They had everything at their feet right there. They fellowshiped. Relationship. Because he walked with them in the cool of the day. Gave them their authority. Told them what to do. And on the seventh day he rested and he turned it all over. Right? But some things had to be shut. Whenever sin came. But once you give your life to Jesus. Then guess what? All mysteries now are yours. Like a gift. Um, but you can't if you don't know what it says. Because you got to know that first. Because that's another thing, too. Again, and I'm going to say this over and over and over and over and over and over. 
We all do. Translation of the word is important. We had somebody the other night that was talking to us about, well, I used to have an NIV until you told me King James. And I said, well, go to the NIV. And they said, well, and see, they were kind of about it at first. I'm like, oh. But after a few minutes, we found out, oh, well, I did go and check it out. And there was the scripture missing. I said, then why would you want it? Why would you get upset at me? Because I told you to get rid of the trash. Because that's really what it is. It's taking out kingdom is what it's doing. It's taking out power. If you look at a lot of the things it's taken out, the word kingdom is leaving. The word power in the Holy Ghost is leaving. Even the words mentioned of the Holy Spirit is leaving. They still use God. Because, well, you got to have some focus point. But the thing is, if you don't know that you can't get to him through his son, then you're going to accept it. And that's not truth. And some of you can, you may go, hey, well, we know this. But there may be some out there that don't. And see, that's another reason why you can't give up if you just sit here and look. I'm going to be real clear because some of y'all got family members y'all are trying to preach to. Why don't they get me? I feel like nobody's hearing me. You know what? You don't know who's hearing you. So just be obedient to God and do what he's asked you to do in the word and let God do what he needs to do. That's what you got to do. So here he says, verse 10, to the intent. Now, what did Jesus, when he came and died on the cross, he brought us back to the original intent that God had so that we operate in the fullness of Jesus himself, the one everything was created by. Unto principalities. Okay? Unto powers in heavenly places. How can you deal with powers in the world if you don't even know the powers of heavenly places? You don't know the principalities in heavenly places? And look, those right there are teachings in themselves. They, it really is. Might be known by the church, the manifolded wisdom of God, because what is wisdom? It's your instruction, right? I can get an instruction, but I gotta know what's my, I got the instruction, but I don't understand. I, 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 have, I just don't understand some things, so then what do we do? We go to the Holy Spirit, we get what? Spiritual understanding. Of what? The knowledge of him. The knowledge of him. Because in him is everything. He tells us how to act, how to behave, everything. According, verse 11, to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now remember, we've been looking at those that, you know, what if you only have one purpose? Man, make it wrong. Because in the one purpose, I promise you, you have also completed other purposes to set up. Remember how we talked about that the temple was supposed to be rebuilt. And everybody said, well, it was David. It was David. David, no, I got the blueprints of it, but who actually built the temple? Solomon. The Solomon. There's still purpose. It can pass down. So why do people think, even though we talk about ushering and returning Jesus Christ, why do we think there's no purpose for the younger generation? Of course there is. We're still here. There's still souls. There's still things to be done. And if you're getting sleepy, wake up. You've got to wake up. Verse 12, and whom we have boldness. Oh, what? Wait, huh? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What? In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So you're telling me, I give my life to Jesus. <clears throat> I begin to have all this knowledge. Holy Spirit's bringing me revelation so that I have, I have boldness. See, I can have revelation of some things, but here's something else the church has failed at. The boldness. 
and the comfortable. How do I know this? Because I know when I got born again and I talked to a lot of people, of that, um, I would put it like this, not the older generation, but the newer generations, they didn't act in the boldness. They didn't have the confidence. They were like, oh no, you love them. I gotta, wait a minute, what? Yeah, you love them, but they're not living right according to this, and isn't it my responsibility to tell them? Yeah, but don't hurt their feelings, because they're being fragile. What? Nobody care about mine? <laughs> care about Jesus? Jesus didn't care about mine. Because if he did care about my feelings, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. Because he's not based on feelings and emotions. He's based on truth. That's why you can't have feelings and emotions when you preach and you teach either when people don't want to hear what you got to say. There's nothing you can do about that. You just preach and teach. Everybody in here has tried to reach someone. Well, if they're not listening, okay. Keep the same way. Shut it off and move on. And that's where right now. We're all coming to a place that we're going to be called out for his name's sake. We were sharing with Amy and Dee earlier. Uh, we went yesterday to a store, and I'm standing there, and there's two gentlemen standing across from me. And uh, I had a shirt on that says, Why wish upon the stars when you can pray to the one that created them? And this guy, I'm sitting here, and I didn't know where he was because he had been walking around. And this guy goes, Do you really believe? And the way he looked, and I looked up, I was, see, I get, I say, oh yeah, I go there. And I, and I know I've got to stop going there so much because I'm so used to it. Especially when I go by myself and, you know, you stand up for words. And some people try to run over you. So here's two minutes, I'm looking at them like, excuse me. And they said it again. Well, he's popping up behind me. And I said, well, absolutely. And then he just steps in and he said, absolutely. We do everything by prayer. And that just started the conversation. Well, in the process, I knew something was a little, a little different. They were telling us about the ministry they offered him. They deal with homeless ministry. They deal with all of South Side, most of South Side, feeding, all that. And they said, oh, yeah, we go out and do this and do that. And we're both still like, I don't know. Something just funky, and the one young man I kept looking at him, trying to talk to me, and he was just very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. And then he was talking to the other gentleman about the whole conversation, so he began to share with us what church they go to. Well, it's one that accepts everything, and we're like, and they, but they call it charismatic. I was like, oh, good, charismatic. Holy Ghost, you know, that's my thinking. But let me tell you something, and we got to be honest with you. Now they're pulling out. Feeding people. Looks like good words. Let's go out. Let's show what we're doing. We're doing good stuff. And I'm over there going, but are you bringing the truth? No, because you're not the truth. You're not right. You're not living truth. Yeah. And but that's, this is one of the moments that I didn't get it. <laughs> He got it. I did when they were explaining what who they were with and, and all this. And, and I saw him. He was kind of changed. I'm like, I knew it, but I just flowed with it. Doesn't mean I changed who I am in it. But those are one of those moments. And then when he walked up, he said, now, you know what they were talking about. And I'm like, well. <laughs> so he got to explain it to me. If the church doesn't stand up and be the church, then this is what we're going to have the results of. Keeping people in bondage to the place that they love us, they love us, they love us, and they have, they have the image, it's a false image, of God. It's a false image, it's a fake image, because what are they doing? Well, we're going out and we're feeding the poor. Right? We're going out and we're helping the widow. We're providing a service. We're providing a need. Great. It's wonderful. But what are you giving them based on truth? 
And there's a lot of it out there. That's why when he talks about us being a remnant, we know what that looks like, right? But the boldness and the power that comes out of the remnant can be earth shaking. It really can. That's why we tell you, you're not here for no reason. You're here for a purpose. Stop fighting the purpose. Well, what do you mean? I'm not fighting the purpose. If you're not fully growing, look, I know I fought it myself. I'm still got areas I think I'm fighting in just because, you know? But isn't that part of growth? And when we all say, oh, no, we fully submit. I say that, too, until God does something. And I'm like, wait a minute. What? What? Ooh, and I, I've been in that place because it's a place I've not been in before. So what's going to come? Fear. Fear's going to come and say, oh, but what if? But what if? But what if? So verse 12 says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Whose faith? By the faith of him. I, I, I can't do it in the faith of my friend. I can't do it believing my friend can because where's my faith lie? In him. In him. That he will do exactly what he said because I still go back to that place and I love it when I got the revelation of it. He said that his word will never return back to him void. Jesus was that word that came, and when it returned back to the Father, it did exactly what it came to do. It did not return void to the Father. It's done. It's finished. Is that not what he said? You can go study that. But when I got revelation of that, I was like, whoo, wait a minute. Hold the phone. What? And it's just by one scripture and revelation that I read where his name is, the word of God. I was like, what? Hold up. And then God just started pouring into me. And I'm like, people need to understand that because they keep, again, but until they get the revelation of it, they can't. They can't understand it. How did I get revelation? I sat and I didn't move until I got it. And when it starts flowing, I'm like, and then some people are like, what? 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 And I'm not even paying attention. It's not I'm being rude. I'm just getting something from the Father that's, woo, I got to have this. I, I can't, mm, right now I love you, but no. And that, and, but it's okay. It's okay. So in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not. So here's Paul. I desire that you faint not at my tribulation. How many see what somebody else goes through and they're like, I don't want to go through that. Come on, I'll raise my hand. I'll raise my hand. I don't want to go through that. Well, who said you are? So you've already got a pre preconceived <laughs> notion. You're going to go through what they've gone through, and that may not be the truth. Because you're going by what you see. So he says, but my desire is that you think not at what you see that I'm going through. But here's what's interesting. He said, wherefore I desire that you think not at my tribulations for you. Because I've got to go through what I've got to go through to get to you what you need. I've got to go through what I'm going through because it's for you. So if, if I've got to go through the junk that I'm going through to get true to you, don't faint at that. Because it's you i got on my mind. But people don't always see it that way. Now I love this. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Because that's a whole other teaching in itself. He says, for your glory. Man. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling them how valuable they are to him. But I wasn't coming to cause that. He's sitting there telling me, if I did not love you, if I did not care, I would not be going through this stuff to get this to you. But it's because of the value that's in it, the riches in him that you need. And you can't get it unless I bring it and teach it. <coughs> For 
Verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Man. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Everything in him. To be strengthened with what? Might. And this is strength. It's a force. And it's a mighty force. That you be strengthened in this. By what? His spirit. See, you can't be strengthened just by the word alone. You've got to be strengthened. First, you've got to learn what the strength is. And then you've got to let the Holy Spirit do the rest. But then you're going to have to accept it because it will challenge your thinking. It will challenge your It will challenge everything in you. It has to. And if it doesn't, then you're not there then. Right? If it really, if it doesn't, you're not there then. That's okay. You don't stop just because you're not there then. You keep going. You keep pushing. You keep pressing. Because he said, what's it going to do? It, it's to strengthen you. To be strengthened with might, that strong power, by his spirit in what? The inner man. He didn't say the outer man. Look, when the inner man's solid, the outer man will line up, I promise you. Because what happens when the inner man's solid? Inner man, something takes place. Romans 8, 11, I got it, I got it. Oh, no, sickness, you got to go now in the name of Jesus. You don't get to stay. Oh, wait a minute, hold up that same resurrection power that lives. The grace Christ from the dead lives on the inside of me. Oh, well, here, let me operate in it. Let me speak to whatever the situation is. That power has to operate because it's on me. So when I speak, I speak with the boldness of Jesus himself through the Spirit. So anything that has a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. But see, we don't want to speak boldly enough because it might sound silly. I don't care anymore. You shouldn't care anymore. For years I sat there and I walked in that and I spoke it and I spoke it and then people come and go, you just, you know, just too much. You know, just calm down. Doesn't take all that. Well, guess what? It does take all that. What does it take? It takes knowing who you are in Him. It takes knowing what is in you. Right? And it takes the boldness that you have given, the confidence that it'll work, and speak it. And if somebody gets mad, oh well. Because you're not operating in an earthly place at that moment. You have pulled everything from heaven that is already on the inside of you out of you. And when heaven's on the scene, earth ain't got no room. But what they're feeling is the pressure of heaven. The enemy, the sickness, the disease, it's feeling the pressure. So what's it going to do? It's probably going to act up a little bit. It's going to scream and holler a little bit and let it keep on applying that pressure. Because eventually, guess what? What did Michael when you humble yourself? And you submit to God? And then we what? And he will what? Believe. We go over that a lot. And a lot of times I say partial scripture and that's one that Michael's like, oh wait, hold up. I love it. Why? Because it's true. When you sit there and you humble yourself up enough to do what God has said, no matter what it feels like, no matter what it feels, humble yourself. Submit. <laughs> apply pressure. Got to apply the pressure. But you got to do it out of the revelation that you have. If you just do it, just to say something and you, it didn't work. Bam. Because you didn't believe it. It's not there yet. It's not in you yet. But when you believe it, you might be shaking in your boots, but you're going to do it. And then, the, but the results didn't happen right away. See, that's where I'm, I'm real funny. It's like, stop talking about the symptoms and just talk the solution. Even if you don't see it right away, don't acknowledge what you don't see because that's not faith. What do you see on the inside that has moved you where your convictions are so strong 
That's all you see. Because it's something that you know. Because what you know is what you see. Come on. Okay. Very simple. We do this all the time. Somebody says, look at a look in your mind. Look at a banana. Everybody sees a banana. It doesn't matter what color you want it to be, that's on you. But if I say red apple, what do you do immediately? Boom. You see the red apple. You can see your faith. You can see your conviction. You can't. Don't tell me you can't, because you can't. And when you do, it rises. It just does something in you. It brings the boldness and the confidence to speak it out. She's speaking gibberish. Amen. I know what I'm speaking. It may sound foolish to you, but it's the word. It's not going to sound right to the fool. It's just not. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Everybody good? Are we sure? Okay, I think some wrap up. I have a lot more, but hey, praise God. So he says, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be what? Strengthened with might by his spirit in the what? The inner man, because that's where it's got to be first. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. When he's talking about this love, he wants you to know how much, how deep, how wide. He loved you, for God so loved the world. He gave his one and only begotten son, right? For those who believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so God did that, but then what did Jesus do? Jesus had to do it. If you know the love that he had for you, it will change you. <clears throat> because he says to be rooted and grounded in what? Love. God is love. You have to be rooted and grounded in that. He loved you so much. We'll sit here. Okay, I'm going to go there and look. We can look at someone. We can love them according to our fleshly love, right? All day long. I love them so much I'd be willing to die for them. But yet Jesus asked you to do something for him. The one that actually has shown you so much love by going to the cross. But because you don't know him, you can't love him. Really like you think you do. And so he asks you to do something when you say, oh, no. See, this is where you got to check your love walk. You really do. And so many times... We put, and I use, it's the only thing I know, in relationships, I love, he loves me so much, he said he would die for me. You don't know that until it's laying right there before us. I love him so much that I would die for him. And it's only because you see it face to face. It's only because you can touch him, you can love him like this. But what greater love came to this earth? Die for me. Don't ever tell me you didn't know him because you came from heaven itself. Yes, you did. You just forgot. You forgot. You've known him. You knew him first. I knew him before I knew any of you. He knew me before he before he maybe knew you. I don't know. Don't care. What I do know is I knew him before I knew you. So why is my allegiance? Really not to the one that loved me so much. He said, I'm going to die for you. See, some people look at it like this. They look at it, well, you'll come die for me now, no, sweetheart. He already did. Yeah. He already did. And what's interesting, he came and did it. I was still up there. I wonder if I sat with him and said, so tell me about it. Have you ever thought of that? It's like, what did we talk about up there? That's like when you have little kids and they tell their little stories about things they see. And it's like, what? I don't leave them alone. They haven't been away from him that long. But over time, it gets ruined out of him. It really does. But if it was kept before him, I don't think it would. <clears throat> I really don't. But in that, I'm sitting there like, man, you'll never die for me. You already did. So why would I get this mindset that he would die for me? No, he already did that. It's already done. But guess what? He's alive. He's living on the inside. 
So I will never die. I will never die. You will never die. If you are here, you will never die. This life, but guess what? This body ain't the one we're going to live forever in. We're going to get glorified body. But the thing is, God's not done with us yet. Here. So Paul's trying to get them to understand. And he then explained to the Gentiles, look, I, I need you to read. Read this. Read what I already know. But then I'm going to teach and I'm going to preach and I'm going to tell you and I'm going to talk to you about these things. And I'm not going to stop talking to you. Because what was it Paul said, you know, that you don't, look, I'm going to keep coming back with the same stuff. I'm going to keep coming back. I'm going to keep coming back. I'm going to keep coming back. Because you too many years. Have you ever sat with somebody and it seems like every time you sit with them, you hear the same story over and over and over and over again? Anything else happened in their life? Well, maybe not to them, but you hear it over and over and over. Make sure you don't get the same mindset when it comes to the world. And that's something you have to focus on. Because you know, every time you look at that word, and we have, we laugh about it because we're like, oh, that is not what I read when I read it the first time. Well, what do you focus? Maybe not on that. Maybe something else. Maybe something else you were reading, and that was your focus. But now you've got that. Hmm. Interesting. But so many people out here are beating themselves up. Well, I've read it, read it, and I didn't see that. Okay, but what did you see in all that? Well, I got this. There you go. But now God's highlighting that. God's wanting you to see this. He's wanting you to know. Now, here's the scripture that we all know and love so much. We'll start at verse 19, then I'll go to 20 of the scripture. It says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, unto him is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without an end. Amen. Now, we see verse 20. How many of y'all know what that's used for? Prosperity. Right? I know. I used to teach it. Preach it. But it says, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passes, it passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Man, that's, that's exceeding, right? Because it, go, it goes on. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. He's talking about this knowledge of the fullness of Christ. He's talking about the knowledge of him. It's not talking about, can I raise my pocketbook a little bit more? That's in part of that, yeah, it, but it's the fullness of him first. Because he says, and according to the power that worketh in us, I have no power to bring money to me except be obedient to the word. Hello. God already told me in his word, I'll provide all your need. My need done. Whatever I need, it's done. But there's still, an, there's still a condition. If I'm not his, I don't get all my need met. I just don't. If you don't believe me, look at the world today. What are they doing? They don't have their need met. Now here's what they've done because many have been taught the word needs is in there, the plural, instead of need. Now they've got themselves so overwhelmed with needs, uh, they're not even focused on one need. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fullness of what? Of God. That we might be filled with all, not a little bit, not some, not a scripture here, not a scripture there. All. Oh. Of the fullness of God. But he's talking about the, that the, and to know that the love of Christ, which passeth all knowledge. I can put my brain and I can sit here and get all this knowledge of Jesus, but I'm telling you, knowledge is not enough. 
One of the biggest things that really helped me, and I know it may sound silly to some, but when I saw the movie Passion, ooh, that, that did something to me because of what I saw in the spirit years prior. And it just brought that to us. Somebody loved me. Now I got an action. I had a visual yet, but then you see it actually in 3D form, whatever you want to call it. It just resonated. And he already did that for me. So how much more could I just do just to say yes? You know? And then to know that now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And to him be glory in the what? The church. He's ready to see his church rise up so that he can be what? Glorified in the church. He's trying to talk to the church and tell the church, look, this is how you're going to grow and how you're going to be. If you're going to just look to see how many people are in attendance, your focus is wrong. If you're going to look just to see who's here and who's not, who's there and who's there, then that's not what he's talking about. You can't. That's why so many people, they'll come to church and they'll just, they come for the wrong focus. The focus is you come for what God has for you, right? And I've noticed more people that are willing to come and sit down even in the oath, talking about within themselves, that will sit in their ugliness, sit in their anger, sit in, just still come and sit down, will be the ones that God is like, okay, it's going to be a rough one, but we got this. And watch what God's going to do because they're there. They stood there. They came and they came and they came. They may not even understand. I know I was one of them. I kept being drawn to the church. And I'm like, why? I don't like none of those people. <clears throat> I did. And it wasn't them. It was me. Because now I'm in a battle. I feel the conviction of change. And I didn't want that. And I didn't. For a long time, I didn't. I didn't budge. But when that day came, because I wouldn't, I, I never stopped going. I never stopped going. And finally, when the day came, it was something that I can't even put into words. It wasn't this like angel singing from heaven I heard or nothing like that. It was just something in me. But it was because I was determined. First off, my determination was wrong because I'm going to teach y'all. I'm going to show y'all. I'll be here for a minute. And I'm going to agitate y'all in the process. And there were people there that would tell you that was true. I was an agitator. Because they told me change. I was like, you want me to change? I'm sure you change. I'm going like, to mess with y'all. And I did. I, I know some people shaking their head like, oh my gosh. Look, we've all got a story. But the thing was, I still came. And God's like, I like that. What did you do with Saul? Saul was around all them Christians. Saul was getting his word. He was getting stuff. And God's like, okay. See, I like him too. Don't like where he's at. Don't like what he's doing. But you know what? He's got something for me. Just like everybody else. Amen. And we tell people, you come back. I don't care. Because the people that I personally, personally over the years, have watched come to church angry, come to church mad, because they stuck it out. Man, they're walking free now. Amen. But it's still a boldness and a confidence. Amen? Everybody good? Yeah. All right, we're going to stop right there. I'm, oh, there's a lot more, but that's what we're going to Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, oh my goodness. We not only thank you for the knowledge of your dear son, we not only thank you for the knowledge of oh, how to live our lives, but we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is going to bring the revelation of that as we continue to stand on the word, even when we don't understand the word. And Holy Spirit, <laughs> thank you for bringing those revelations. I'm so grateful and so thankful, Jesus, that, that you love me so much that my, I can't comprehend it. But I know, I know you love me so much. That you not only gave your life for me, 
but for everyone here, everyone out there, so that they can come into the knowledge of you and the Father and the Spirit. To walk in the, the mighty power, to take the knowledge, to gain the revelation, no more mysteries, but truth to walk in and operate in. Lord, I thank you that you've given us every opportunity, every way out, so that we can never stand and say we didn't know. And that we continue to yield ourselves to the truth. Lord, I ask you to bless everyone here, bless everyone out there. Lord. You see their hurts, you see their challenges, and you see the struggles and the challenges, but they accepted the challenge. And that they have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. And that they have the boldness to continue to seek the word and stand and wait for the revelation of who they are in him, in Jesus. So that God, you can have all the glory. And we love you. Amen. Amen. Amen.